having us here as uh, indie authors. You know, it was just a great place to be, is to be able to read in a beautiful bookstore like this. So this is a, a, just a wonderful day. I am the author of the Hypothesis of Giant series. I have two of the books published, and they're currently available on Amazon, and also on my website. And uh, yeah, no, it's just been a, a thrill, um, you know, getting these out and sharing the stories with all of you. So uh, my series is about, is a dystopian um, <coughs> slash fantasy novel series that you know, um, basically the world I've created is that this place wouldn't exist or if there is a bookstore or a library, it's only for the common good government officials to be able to enjoy. They want to make sure that, you know, the only books that you are reading are textbooks mandated by the common good government. And uh, so they want to try to keep, you know, people, you know, believing what they want to believe. And so that's really what happened. The, the world I've also created is that, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of religion is abolished. And uh, because they don't, they believe that you know religions fighting against each other, like that was the world before the Common Good Party rose, and that is the ideal and Inspector Harold, who um, you know really want to try to keep the peace, right? By believing that religions and you know people, um, you know, thinking for themselves um, is what caused those problems in the, the prior world. So um, it was uh, the first book, The Assumption. I'm going to read a little and just to set it up. So right now, the, actually, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> okay, so the, this is the chapter one, which is labeled uh, Conchelle. Nobody questioned the sacred hour in the town of Candlewick anymore. For the past 15 years, everyone had learned to sleep through the bell chimes that rang out exactly one hour prior to the sun rising over the, the United States of the common good. The ideal, the leader of this newly founded country, enforced it strongly on the basis that it was to keep the people safe. There were rare occasions when an angry or defiant individual disobeyed this law. These unfortunate individuals were caught, imprisoned, and never heard from again. The sacred hour was seen as a symbol of unity among the people. This is the way it was, and the way it would always be. It was a sweltering night in July, and the town of Tadlewick was fast asleep during the sacred hour. The one girl woke out of her slumber, eyelids open, and ears perked up as if still in the confines of the dream. She froze, fearful that she had heard the sound of error and that she was imagining things. But then the deep bellowing noise echoed again from beyond her window sill. She sprang out of her bed and dashed to the open window. She tried to discern from which direction the noise came. She held her breath, afraid that if she disturbed the silence of the night, it would not sound again, counting the seconds in her head. Then it sounded again, loud and clear through the night, and the direction of its source was from the little ruby red house directly opposite her on Wishbone Avenue. No lights were on as the house lay hidden beneath the honey locust trees with their long branches intertwined and thorns sticking upward like a spiked fence. The old, weather-beaten shutters were hanging off their hinges as if they were fighting for survival, and the overgrown blades of grass resembled a wild prairie that had grown as high as the top of the front porch. A statue of a black cat stood guard beside the wicker rocking chair, and the paint was chipping off the scripted engraving of the number 15 right above the chalky white screen door. The ominous street was vacant except for the occasional common good patrol car driving past, its headlights radiating through the shadows of the starless night to ensure that curfew was being obeyed again. She heard the sound again. She could have sworn it was the conch shell resounding from the confines of the ruby red house. It blew again and she opened the window another inch and pressed her ear against the opening. It sounded like the musical outburst was searching the night for someone to hear his cry for help. Silence ensued again and she whispered into the night, I hear you, do you need help? My name is Aurora. The sound resonated again in her ears like a whisper in the night, translating itself inside her mind. Aurora. Alarmed, she quickly slammed the window shut but fell backward over her tower of textbooks that were piled against the wall. She lay there facing the ceiling, trying to catch her breath, her heartbeat racing. Then she dusted herself off and fixed her purple nightgown, covering her knees again before peeking through the cool glass of the window pane, resisting the urge to blink. Silence prevailed over the night as she waited for the conch shell to sound again. She stared into the darkness of the night, but drifted off to sleep as a little ruby red house stared back at her unflinching. So this basically set up that um, only Aurora and one other boy in the neighborhood, Boris, who's like the town <coughs> troublemaker, can hear this conch shell sound. And what they discover in this mysterious ruby red house is that there is um, a 30 foot giant living there named Otis. And um, they, along with Otis, are predestined to um, get to the Northern Lights to prevent a cataclysmic event from happening, which is called the geometric storm. 
And a um, little interesting fact that I ended up coming up with the names Aurora Boreas because the Northern Lights is the Aurora Borealis. And when I did some research, I discovered that Aurora is the goddess of dawn and Boreas was for a mythological um, god of the North Wind. And I thought, oh, how cool would this be to have them develop these powers on this journey and that them along with this, you know, this giant will need to work together to prevent the storm, but also in addition, um, they have to fight against Inspector Harold, who is the leader of the Common Good Army, who is trying to prevent them from reaching their goal because they want to try to keep the people under their control. So it's a lot of um, it's a it's an adventure story. There's fantasy. There's you know um, also you know the themes also can um, transcend to you know uh, what's happening in our own world today, which is um, you know an interesting take. So it's not only just for you know teenagers, but also for adults can enjoy it as well. Any questions? <laughs> and I was so excited I got the second book out this year, right after I gave birth to my, my beautiful baby girl. And so I dedicated it to Lily. And uh, so she was along for the ride when I was editing and, <laughs> and getting this book ready. And I can't wait to, to share the story with her when she's older. So it's like excited to with all of you. So, uh, so thank you again. And we're selling the books downstairs. So um, they're each for ten dollars, and then for a book, it's two for fifteen. So and oh, um, you question. mentioned you had a website. What's the name of the oh. website? Oh. <laughs> uh, com. Feel free to stop by, say hi, and uh, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.